It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Cecil Carnes, noted author and foreign correspondent. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable John F. Floberg, Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Air. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Mr. Floberg, it of course is a pleasure to have you with us tonight to discuss some of the problems of the United States Navy. Now, sir, I'm sure that uh, our viewers are interested in uh, some aspects of the naval war in Korea. Now, it's true that uh, we have been fighting a naval war for more than two years, isn't it? Well, it's uh, much more of a naval campaign than most people realize, Mr. Huey. Uh, uh, they Navy has a substantial force in the Far East, uh, approximately 150 combat ships. And as you probably know, uh, the, the Navy and Marine Corps uh, run about a third of the combat sorties that are run in the Far East. About uh, 99 and two thirds percent of the logistic support that crosses the Pacific is uh, transported by the Now those Navy. 150 combat ships, approximately how many men are involved in the Korean War and Navy personnel? Oh, I couldn't give you that in, uh, even in round numbers. So. Now, uh, has, the, has the Korean War been expensive for the Navy in men and material? Well, it's been pretty expensive in material. You know, we've uh, fired, uh, I think it's almost as much ammunition as was fired in World War II. I do know that the carrier-based planes have expended more ammunition than in World War II. Uh, it hasn't been as expensive in lives for the Navy itself, although we've lost a substantial number of aviators. Uh, the Marine Corps had over 2,800 killed in the Far East. They, you've lost a considerable amount of equipment, I assume, airplanes. Yes, there's been a rather heavy attrition on airplanes. The and anti-aircraft is pretty good in Korea. And, and of course, your losses, uh, enemy losses, are principally from anti-aircraft fire. As far as airplanes are concerned, yes, sir. Most of your missions are low-level missions that, are, that the Navy flies in the Navy yes. and Marine Corps? For the greater part, the Navy's, uh, Navy and Marine Corps air effort has been in uh, close air support and in the interdiction mission. Most of that is conducted at low level, which is the most hazardous level as far as uh, the aircraft fire is concerned. Yes, that's, it seems to me that uh, that's one of the uh, branches of our effort that doesn't get much publicity, isn't it? That uh, low level flying, it's done by both the Navy and the Air Force. Well, that, that's right. In both the Navy and the Air Force, by far the great proportion of missions is conducted at relatively low level. And uh, that's where the great proportion of losses takes place, too. Mr. Fulbert, shifting for a moment from the air, has the Navy run into uh, any submarine warfare in Korea? Uh, no, sir. There have been various kinds of stories, but uh, nothing... The North there. Koreans don't have any submarines, as far as we know. Well, no, sir. As far as we know. There have been no, uh, no casualties uh, in the Navy from uh, any surface or submarine craft. Uh, there have been enemy. casualties from uh, shore bombardment, uh, fr that is from shore batteries shooting back at the ships, and there have been a uh, fair number of casualties from mines, too. We've lost about four or five minesweepers over there. But well, moving on from the war in Korea, of course, the Navy is a uh, principal effort at the moment, I suppose, is planning for what may be a larger war, isn't it? Well, we're vitally concerned with uh, any potential difficulties. You're, you're concerned uh, strategically with a possible war against Russia, I assume. Well, we're concerned with anything that might come up. Well, what is the primary mission of the Navy in, uh, at, at the moment? Well, the, the Navy's big job, of course, uh, not at just at the moment, but uh, forever, is control of the seas. That's our, our big mission. How important to that, uh, to the control of the seas, is your naval air power? Mr. Well, that is the key to control of it. The same as control of the seas is key to the national security, the, the national economy, the national industry, the national standard of living. And the naval air power is the key to that control of the sea because whoever controls the air above it is going to control the air below it. Is it fair, as for our people who are trying to understand the, the, very, the evolution of the Navy, the Navy is now uh, principally... Uh, 
Uh, an Air Force, isn't it? Well, uh, a seaborne, a waterborne Air Force? Uh, no, I wouldn't call it a waterborne Air Force. What I would say is that uh, uh, the airplane is the most significant single weapon today in the Navy. It is a means to an end. It's, a, it's one of the weapons the Navy has, the most powerful, effective, long-range weapon, but it's just a weapon like the other weapons. Well, this great uh, area of water on the Earth's surface, uh, your way for uh, maintaining control of that is principally through your aerial weapon, isn't it? That's right. The, uh, the aircraft carrier is the, is the principal fighting ship of the Navy, isn't it? It is the major ship today in the Navy, yes. And, and all else goes to support that, either directly or indirectly. So, so you essentially operate uh, uh, wa waterborne airfields and, and uh, ships that go along to protect your airfield. No, not just airfields, air bases, because they're complete with shops, fuel supplies, ammunition storage, uh, repair facilities, uh, technical experts to handle all kinds of particular problems that come up. Uh, that is the whole nature of naval air power. Well, and uh, for any place on the 70% of the Earth's surface that's covered by water. And, and to expand on that a little further, uh, historically, ever since the earliest days, control of the sea has depended on mounting the weapon of the day on a ship. That was true of the ramming prow, that was true of the sword and the musket and the smoothbore cannon and the naval rifle and the propeller driven airplane and the jet airplane today and whatever comes tomorrow. What would be the principal threat that, uh, that any prospective enemy poses, would you say, the submarine? Uh, yes, a submarine is the major threat today well, because there's no readily apparent major surface force uh, uh, going to It could be us. arrayed against us. That's correct. Well, don't you think, uh, well, since you have, or isn't it true that you have long-range airplanes in the Navy, do you have long-range airplanes? Yes, we do. We have a, uh, the Truckee Turtle, as you know, still holds the world's long-distance record a little over 11,000 miles. That's right. I'd forgotten about that. Well, now, why couldn't the Navy then concentrate with the long-range uh, planes and knock out submarines instead of... Uh, uh, going after them uh, all together with aircraft carriers, or is that your idea? No, it isn't uh, uh, at all our idea. Uh, we, we're going to fight submarines in four different places. Uh, uh, one place, and the worst place, is to fight them in the screens of your own convoy. That's uh, uh, the ideal situation for the submarine, because there the, the fighter of the submarine has a problem of location and classification as a submarine and identification to make sure it's an enemy submarine, and then a complicated fire control problem on a maneuvering target that's working in his own element. And the next place to fight him is in the open seas uh, between his bases and our supply lane, our lanes of commerce. That's a bad place too because it's a needle in the haystack proposition, but it's better than the first. The next place that's good to fight him is in his training areas. Uh, there he's relatively amateur compared to you, and you might have him at a tactical disadvantage. Finally, the final place to fight him is at his own base alongside the dock where he's either being repaired or resupplied or something of that sort. There you don't have any problem of location or classification or identification and your fire control problem is reduced to a bomb control problem, but you run into a different problem in the latter two places. There you run into defenses by high performance fighter aircraft. MiG-15 is a pretty good intercept. Are you ready for that? Well, that's exactly what you run up against. And in order to attack him in those two latter places, which are really the two better places, you have to have equally high-performance aircraft to get in there and fight them. And long-range aircraft aren't high-performance. They sacrifice the long for long-range. Long yeah. Well, they're relatively unmaneuverable and relatively indefensible. Uh, you, what you well, gain on the bananas, you always lose on the peanuts, and that's what you do when you try to get performance in the air. And Russia but is uh, really loaded, isn't she, with submarines? She has a very formidable array of submarines. Well, you, you can pretty largely spin the wheel and take your number, but we know that she has at least five times as many as the Germans had to start the well, last Well, just world. a word on this, Mr. Floberg. Our viewers uh, know that uh, these weapons cost an awful lot of money today. Now, in round figures, what's the United States Navy costing the American taxpayers now. Well, all, all military preparations cost money. The Navy's budget this year is a little over $12 billion. And what proportion of the total defense outlay is that? Uh, that is uh, just about a quarter, roughly. Just, just about one-fourth of it. Now, uh, what uh, is the Navy? Our, our audience, of course, uh, is concerned with the, uh, is familiar with the long argument over the propriety of these vast uh, floating airfields. Is there any uh, serious opposition uh, to that strategy of the Navy of creating more and more of these vast uh, floating airfields? Uh, not that I know of, seriously. 
And there is some uh, amateur opposition, but no serious that I know. I see. And, and you are you are committed now to building more and more of those uh, floating uh, air bases. Well, we're committed to control of the sea, and you have to have that, or else abandon control of the 70% of the Earth's surface that's covered by water and live in the 2% that we occupy in the United States of America. Well, what about and the argument that you hear over and over again that uh, one lucky hit and poof, there goes millions and millions and millions of dollars on these aircraft carriers? Well, uh, th that's never been true that there's been one lucky hit and... Uh, and but you're in the uh, atomic age now. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we like that. Uh, that makes the aircraft carrier that much more powerful. That makes it that, that much more versatile and that and much... And your sting is 400 to 1, maybe. Uh, if you carry 400 planes, you've got 400 chances to uh, to uh, carry the attack. Is that the idea? I don't, I don't know if I would reduce it arithmetically quite that way, but uh, uh, th the point is that the, the carrier is an offensive weapon. Yes. And atomic weapons are offensive, too. Yes. And the offensive punch of these ships has just increased astronomically by virtue of the introduction of atomic weapons. Do you weapons. think you're ahead of the, of the Russians in that, in that possibility? Well, the, 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 uh, the we remember, we have a 30-year history of successful operation of aircraft carriers, and we have a, a national history of, of victory at sea. But if we can and carry uh, A-bombs uh, uh, in uh, these uh, small planes off the decks of uh, aircraft carriers, can't they? They don't have any aircraft carriers. Well, now, sir, Thank as, heavens. Uh, as a final question, uh, our Navy is, ma in, is maintained today in a, in a state of readiness, uh, even for war on the, on the worldwide scale, isn't it? Within the limitations of our overall size, we are well ready to perform our missions. Yes, sir. Well, I'm sure that our audience has very much appreciated these forthright statements from you, Mr. Fulberg, and thank you for being with us. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Cecil Carnes. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable John F. Floberg, Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Air. You know, one of the virtues of our free enterprise system is the benefit to the public from goods of better quality and lower prices which spring from free and open competition. And certainly the stimulus of competition has resulted in making Longines watches ever finer and finer. And it was in free and open competition that Longines watches themselves won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and highest honors for accuracy from the great government observatories. And so Longines became, in fact, the world's most honored watch for their superior qualities of excellence, elegance, greater accuracy, and longer life, Longines watches have become the first choice of the discriminating men and women of every country of the free world. So if you wish to buy a very fine watch, either for yourself or as a gift, look for the true quality in the watch you buy, and your choice will be Longines, the world's most honored watch. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. See, I've got a secret on the CBS television network.